how the internet is designed. So I mentioned in the last uh, video that we're going to go over how the tiered structure of the internet works and such, but we'll we'll start with uh, how packets are switched, uh, how data is switched from one location to another, and then we'll go into the tiered structure. So uh, the internet really there there's older methods and newer methods. So the older method is called uh, circuit switching. And then there's uh, the newer method, which is preferred for pretty much everything now, uh, called packet switching. And circuit switching, uh, you basically create one dedicated connection from point A to point B. So let's say we have uh, point A, and then we have, we're going to put him over here, we're going to have point B, uh, and then he's going to go through the ISP's network, uh, and then inside the ISP's network might be an additional number of paths that they can take. With a circuit switch network, uh, you will connect up there, and then as data goes from point A to point B, when you create that connection, it will actually create a specific path for that data to transmit across and then that connection is yours and it's dedicated to you so whether or not there is traffic being sent and received across that connection that connection is always there and it's very wasteful uh, not only is it wasteful because if there's no data being sent then it's wasted bandwidth that's just sitting there unused but it's also not very fault tolerant so if uh, if one of these connections goes down the circuit has to renegotiate a new connection if that protocol allows for that to happen um, then it's really not a preferred method and and so pretty much all circuit connections have gone away uh, there's still some but really that's it's pretty much phased out anymore uh, the easiest way to think of circuit switching is uh, the old telephone network, the public switched telephone network. Uh, when you would pick up the phone at point A and you dial, you know, Johnny over at point B, it would do exactly this. It would create a dedicated connection, and you could hear when you picked up the phone and did that. You could hear it clicking and connecting you through the different locations the different switching stations and opening up that channel for you to communicate across but then since that channel was created and that that connection was open whether or not you said any words or not it was still your connection that's circuit switching packet switching is where we'll back some of this stuff out clear this out here there we go packet switching uh, these are all you can consider these all interconnected already internally inside the provider's network and then you'll have a connection up to one side and a connection down to the other side and then as you send data up into their network the packets which are pieces of your data which we'll get into the, the data from your application gets segmented down into little pieces those packets then can go one direction or they can go a different direction they can come down here and then go over this way they can go down here back to B to where it's supposed to be going uh, and then when he returns traffic it can also go up this way across here you know down here back again it could go all over the place it doesn't matter and whether those since those connections are always there and the packets are put onto the wire whenever it's needed the downtime when that connection is not being used by you can be used by somebody else so it's very efficient on the provider side uh, as well as the same idea happens on your internal network when you have a larger internal network uh, but it's a much more efficient method of communicating because the data gets broken down in little pieces and then the pieces can float throughout that network however they need to uh, to get to where their whatever their destination is, um, and if you're not communicating, then somebody else can be using that connection. 
Uh, also, if one of these connections goes down, say this one goes down, the protocols involved there can make sure that the packets get routed a correct method and more or less you know you might lose one packet or something like that usually or less <laughs> um, if that happens uh, so it's it's very fast to renegotiate where your packets are supposed to go it's very fault tolerant you can have uh, many many connections uh, between all sorts of different devices and it will work uh, nicely so that is the preferred method is packet switching now so that's that's the difference between circuit and packet switching so let's talk about uh, the tiered IP structure or a tiered ISP structure so we'll make a new layer the ISPs as I mentioned at the end of the last one um, the backbone was taken over by the larger providers such as like MCI and Sprint and such and those who own the actual cables that go you know across the United States this is my terrible United States <laughs> those that go across the United States these cables are owned by the tier 1 providers so these these are the tier 1 guys and those will be uh, like Sprint and nowadays uh, Verizon um, the people who own the cables, AT&T, they own these connections that are physically in the ground or in the water going across the Atlantic or the Pacific or something like that. Um, sometimes them. Usually it's some other company actually for the subsea cables. But that's what the Tier 1 providers are. They own the physical infrastructure. The Tier 3, or sorry, Tier 2 guys, they lease we'll put them up here tier 1 tier 2 and then we have tier 3 and it goes down the pecking order goes down like that so these guys own own the cable and then the tier 2 guys they lease the cable they lease a connection from the tier 1 So the tier two guys, they might be your regional ISPs, and I was mentioning before that it was more fractured before. Nowadays, tier one through three sometimes are the same company. <laughs> um, like if you have a connection from Verizon, well, Verizon may own the cables, so they're tier one, but they're also acting as the regional guy who's tier two, and he's also your local guy because he's tier three. So that's kind of how this is broken down. You have like the national or global tier one guys you have the regional which they might take care of like a couple states uh, and then you have the local ones which are like you know your local town or something like that back when uh, the internet was relatively new in like the the mid 90s or late 90s you'd sometimes have you know uh, AT&T as a tier one you'd have uh, a regional guy who would lease the connection from the tier one guy and then he in turn would then lease the connection to a tier one, tier three one, which might um, be your local internet provider. So there were a lot of real small dial-up um, internet providers back then, uh, like around where I am, they used to be called Net Carrier and Internet Connect of Delaware County, ICDC, and stuff like that. There were a lot of smaller companies who would then uh, lease the connection in turn from the tier two, and. Uh, that's kind of now started to condense itself with all these companies purchasing each other and we have Verizon laying down all the fiber optic now and they own the cable as well as lease it directly to you so it's kind of gone away from this multi-tiered system but that's that was the original idea behind it where you'd have uh, certain companies in charge of certain uh, certain levels of the infrastructure uh, Within the internet, we have what I mentioned before as multiple protocols uh, and convergence of, uh, of all this data across the internet. Uh, so as part of that, these providers on their networks, uh, as well as internally in your own network, uh, can determine a quality of service, QoS, 
a quality of service of certain types of traffic. So within their own networks, they'll do this. And there, there's many news articles and famous <laughs> stuff that's happened about the classification of their different types of traffic. But uh, it's a beneficial thing, usually, uh, where it helps you define what traffic is more important. So with quality of service uh, across the Internet, it, it helps you ensure that uh, voice traffic, for example, voice over IP, um, has a higher priority than, fix that, it has a higher priority than, say, browsing the Internet. And part of the reason may be because for VoIP, uh, you know, if you're speaking to somebody, if packets get delayed, then you're going to start talking, you know, all chopped up. Uh, if, or if, you know, a packet gets routed, if, uh, you know, a slow route or something like that, you might hear a word from a second ago or something like that and it gets all funky. Uh, with HTTP, with browsing the web or something like that, if it gets delayed a second, well, it doesn't really matter. It'll rebuild itself, which we'll learn about. It'll rebuild itself in your browser and you'll just see it as a slight delay, but the actual data is still intact there. It just took an extra second to load. So quality of service within your network as well as what's defined within your internet provider's network, which you don't have control over usually, um, determines how how uh, how fast that data gets to where it's supposed to go based on what kind of data it is. Um, we also have within this we have um, other protocols involved, as I mentioned before, TCP and UDP. Uh, those are also involved in determining how fast, well, not necessarily how fast, but how, well, it, 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 yeah, how fast data gets to where it needs to go. So with TCP, you have, remember I mentioned acknowledgments? TCP will say, yes, this data got here. You can now send the next packet, uh, and then it will receive another packet and say, yes, I received that packet. I've acknowledged it. Send me the next packet, and it will keep doing that. If it misses one, it'll say, hey, give me that other packet. I didn't get it. And then it'll send the other piece of data. So for certain uh, implementations, such as browsing the web, that's what you want. Because you don't want to have a, you know, a graphic missing on a web page or something like that because it didn't get sent. You know, I'll just let it send the data again one more time, wait an extra second, and then it'll actually show me everything that I want. Uh, whereas with UDP, for certain things, we don't really want that. You know, if, if you miss a quarter of my word when I'm talking to you with VoIP, you don't really want to get that a second later. It's going to sound really weird and it's really unnecessary. Uh, but if it were left out, if you missed that quarter piece of a word when I'm speaking to you over the phone, well, you can your brain will pretty much figure out, you know, that it's what it is and it's not that big of a deal. So we have UDP in that uh, perspective where it has a smaller We'll get into this, but it has a smaller header, and so it transmits a little bit faster. And it also doesn't use acknowledgments, no ACK. So it just sends the data there, hopes it gets there. If it does, great. Uh, so these two, and when we're talking about internet protocol, are very important. And we'll get into that more when we start talking about the OSI layers, and and how they communicate, and and what their job really is that's all involved in the internet and making sure things get where it needs to go. Uh, within the internet we also have security concerns obviously uh, not as much of an issue back in the 80s and 90s when things were conceived so we have new protocols coming about uh, every year now trying to tackle this security problem uh, involved with the internet even original protocols like domain name service um, DNS has uh, been attacked in the last several years and they've come up with new versions and new ways of tackling that. There's uh, HTTPS now for secure methods of transferring uh, data to and from websites like when you're doing online banking or something like that. Uh, there's there's different levels that you can choose. Um, you might want uh, confidentiality, you know, you might want encryption of your of your data so people can't see it and read it. Uh, you may have the requirement of integrity of your data. You want to make sure that someone in the middle doesn't take your data, tweak it a little bit, send it along its way, 
and the receiving end thinks that it's okay. Um, there's ways to get a, you know to make sure that the integrity is maintained. Uh, and availability, you can have um, problems with uh, you know people denial of servicing things and trying to take down your systems. Um, availability is also a concern with security, trying to keep things up and running smoothly with while keeping the bad guys out essentially. Uh, since the internet is a big interconnected mass of the entire world essentially at this point, you know, these are very um, major issues that have to be addressed uh, and even more so as more and more people join in every year. Uh, as for the future of networking, we've talked about a little bit with the convergence aspect. All the different networks that used to be separate, voice and video and data and all these things that all used to be separate, they're now into one network that we have to deal with. That's a major thing. Um, you'll probably see that out there a lot if you look at job boards or the certifications coming up. Um, you know, IP, voice over IP, video over IP, all that is, is major now. Uh, especially over wireless too, that's that's exploding. Uh, speaking of wireless, I mean mobility is huge. Only a few years ago people didn't have smartphones like we do now. Everyone has a computer in their pocket that can access the internet at any moment. That's huge. That's that's you know a definite future of networking where we're not just going to have computers and desktops sitting at our PCs accessing the internet, but everything is going to access the internet. We have um, an internet of things essentially is what they what they try to call it um, back in the early 2000s with the dot-com boom people were talking about oh well the you know your refrigerator is going to be connected to the internet and you're going to download stuff with that and you can get recipes and then it's going to go send you a, a it'll contact the um, grocery store and say hey I'm out of milk <laughs> and stuff like that which you know were so amazing and cool and then it didn't happen really but it's actually starting to happen now. So that's that's a definite future of all these interconnected devices. Um, from a pure networking standpoint, not even internet-wise, uh, you have home uh, networks really starting to come together with um, uh, management of, of home devices where you know your smoke detectors can talk to uh, your phone and tell you, you know, whether or not they went off. You can turn off uh, home automation of turning on and off lights and opening your garage door and locking your doors and stuff remotely and looking at cameras and all these things are interconnected in your home even. Uh, that's a huge future of networking and uh, the internet in general. Uh, so going from here, uh, we're going to uh, talk a bit more about how to communicate across a network and across the internet. Uh, now that we've covered some of the basics of what the internet is and uh, you know how it's designed, how do we communicate across it or across a network in general.